This is a heap of sand. This isn't a heap of sand. No apparent problem. But this heap and non-heap are the basis for a classic logic paradox called the Sorites paradox, from the Greek word soros, which just means heap. Where's the paradox? Suppose that we accept these two premises about heaps and non-heaps. One grain of sand is not a heap. One grain of sand is too small to make a difference in determining whether something is or is not a heap. In other words, adding one grain to a non-heap doesn't make a heap. Then we have that one grain isn't a heap. Neither is two or three and so forth. So this isn't a heap and neither is this or this or even this, the actual heap we started with. A simple induction proof, starting with a base case of one, shows that no number of grains is enough to make a heap. But that's clearly false. One way to look at this paradox is that we have a logical problem. We started with premises that seemed reasonable. We applied logical reasoning in a way that seemed right. Yet we derived a conclusion that's wrong. If we look at the problem this way, it's hard to dig our way out. We're certainly not going to argue that our inductive proof is wrong, given our premises. Instead, let's take a different approach. We have a semantic problem. The two premises we've written don't do a good job of defining the meaning of the English, or Greek, or whatever, word heap. We need to do better. But how? Well, we could replace the two premises we just wrote by a single one that says that something is a heap of sand if and only if it is otherwise heap-like, and it contains at least 102,576 grains of sand. But why that number? Why not 102,530 or 103,000? Any number will do to get us out of the paradox. But it's hard to choose a number. The problem is that the English word heap is vague in a very useful way. But as a result, we don't know exactly how to assign meaning to it which in our current enterprise means that we don't know what premises to write about it. And it's not alone. Someone with 200,000 hairs on their head is definitely not bald. Someone with 10 hairs is bald. What about someone with 20,000? Bald, too, is vague. A man whose height is 7 feet is tall. A 5-foot man isn't tall. What about a 5'9 man? Again, tall is vague. Even words that seem clear can be vague in some contexts. This is an apple. Take a bite, it's still an apple. And another bite, and a few more bites, still an apple. Now eat all but a crumb. For sure, this isn't an apple. Exactly when did the juicy red thing cease being an apple? We're used to dealing with vagueness in everyday reasoning. A lot of the time, it doesn't matter. If it does, we can use qualifying words like tiny heap of sand, or balding, or part of an apple. If we want to formalize reasoning of this sort, there are some options, for example, fuzzy logic. But in many of the kinds of problems where it's most important that we formalize our reasoning, and often make it computable, we solve the vagueness problem by fiat. We define it away. Mathematicians cannot work with vague predicates. They're very careful to provide precise definitions of the terms they use. So for example, a prime number is an integer greater than 1 that has no factors except itself and 1. This definition clears up any confusion that might have existed, say, about boundary cases. Database designers do the same thing. For example, our university's registrar defines full-time student to be someone enrolled for 12 hours or more. 11 hours simply isn't. 12 is. In an HR database, we might define benefits eligible as someone who works at least 30 hours a week. 29 isn't enough. 30 is. By the way, we do this not just because we want to dig our way out of the Sorites paradox. We do it for a variety of reasons, legal, morale, whatever. Such definitions make it possible for everyone to understand the rules and to know that they're being applied fairly. So what's the bottom line? Is the Sorites paradox really a paradox at all? Does it force us, for example, to question the soundness of mathematical induction? No. But what it does do is to highlight one of the many complexities that arise when we attempt to map statements in English or Greek into the language of formal logic.